Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Jack. Back again to talk about the state of Dragonflight. Uh, there's been a lot of kind of back and forth going on as to whether or not Dragonflight is ready. And so I wanted to go kind of step by step through some of the different things that really make up an expansion, go over some of my thoughts as to their own level of preparedness, and then kind of give a whole summary as to whether I think Dragonflight's in good shape, needs improvement, if, you know, if it's trouble, what can actually fix it up, and all that jazz. For me, I've been in every alpha or beta since but world Wars of draenor ever since i have not taken a break from the game uh, since i started playing in firelands cataclysm type era uh, and i feel like i have a lot of experience as well of how prepared the de dev cycle the bugs the issues whatever and how well they really get fixed so starting it off i want to talk about some of the raid content with vault of the incarnates we've done a ton of raid testing at this point for vault and usually the process ends up going, you test all the fights in Heroic, you test some of the fights on Mythic, you test Normal, the LFR comes out, etc. We're kind of at the point now where LFR is being tested, and this is definitely a later test cycle for the raid. Uh, I remember back into like Legion beta, we had the expansion releasing on like the latter half of the year, and even like early summer, I believe, we were having like Nighthold testing, and we didn't even have Nighthold until well after, you know, Emerald Night, it was Emerald Nightmare, Trial of Valor, and then we were getting into, you know, the meat and potatoes really of Nighthold. So we had a ton of different testing going on already in advance of that. I believe that's what it was, am I crazy? Yeah, that was, that was the order. So it's kind of weird having things push back so much for Vaults of the Incarnates, but Going through just about all of the raid testing, I can say the bugs to the fights and everything like that were not really beyond the pale, nothing too scary, nothing too crazy. Uh, I'm not a huge fan, personally, of not testing the end boss. Uh, Jailer was like an alright fight, but it was definitely not that interesting compared to some of the other behemoths that we've had over the years. Uh, I'm also personally of the opinion that a lot of raid boss fights and end boss encounters have been kind of stagnant and more bursty as well than I'd really like in terms of the damage. I remember even in like BFA we had like Jaina and it was like entire phases of no damage. Jailer's really odd for that too where you have these like 20-30 second periods of time where there were like no damage happening and so in my biased opinion obviously as a healer I'm like what the hell is happening? When we got a chance to test Nazoth for example uh, I really noticed very similar things happening while we were testing that boss and they like triple or quadrupled the amount of like passive damage going on throughout the encounter, which made things a hell of a lot more interesting and made mechanics a hell of a lot deadlier. So my concern, obviously being a healer player, is getting into that situation where we get into that last boss fight and it is like a three heal encounter or it is a minimal heal encounter or there are these vast swaths of time where you're not really doing your job as a healer and you're kind of just sitting around putzing around. We have the dungeon journal, we can see what some of the mechanics are, and I could be entirely wrong, but I just know from my own experience with end boss fight testing that sometimes, actually a lot of times, healers and you know, DPS players, tank players, everybody from across the board will find those annoyances and find those frustrations throughout the boss testing, give feedback, things get changed, and it's just always better when you can have thousands and thousands of players testing your boss rather than the usual 20 30 people on the testing team doing it for eight hours a day a week straight or something like that or multiple weeks straight right it just doesn't compare so i am a little miffed um and obviously people can think differently there's the hype around the world first to consider there's the extra challenge that gets added into the mix for that race uh, but otherwise i would say vaulting incarnates pretty damn neat you have a really gorgeous instance and it plays into a lot of the elemental effects but you're not just fighting, you know, air elementals and rock elementals and everything on the t all the time. You're getting to fight massive giant spiders in addition to, obviously, big old dragons, uh, as well as just like this wind elemental fused with like a night elf. Uh, I think all those things are actually quite interesting. There's a couple throwbacks that kind of remind me of like Battle for Dazar lore in terms of uh, kind of like choosing how you're interacting with some of the boss fights, which is always really fun. And I will say, it doesn't seem like it's some revolutionary, game-breaking type of uh, boss encounter, but it is still pretty fun, and I'm looking forward to it. When it's coming to an M-plus environment, this is kinda terrifying, I gotta be able to be honest with you guys. When we hit Shadowlands Season 4, we brought back a lot of old dungeons, but nobody really tested them all that much on PTR. 
We got a little bit of experience with like the shrouded affix, and I know I'm talking about Dragonflight, but bear with me on this one. We talked about the shrouded affix, we talked about some pros and cons, they changed a couple things around, they fiddled with it, they added percent, they changed around the secondary tuning, they changed around the mob tuning, and then that was about it. Uh, most people did not go crazy with jumping into Karazhan and grinding it all day long and figuring all the different routes out in advance. Everyone was kind of like, yeah, well, we'll get there when we get there, not taking it too terribly seriously. When you are comparing that to Beta Mythic Plus, going into Shadowlands, we had Beta Mythic Plus like three or four months before Shadowlands actually released, and we got all the dungeons really early. Prideful uh, obviously took a bit of time as well to get it added into the mix, but we had so much time to figure everything out, and we had so much time to sort of interact with the dungeons themselves. It's really, really strange being in this position for Dragonflight, where we now have seven of the eight dungeons, we still don't have the eighth, and there is an absolute slew of tuning, adjustments, and fixes that still need to be able to happen. It's, it's happening, it's happening slowly. Uh, some of the things they're doing are like adjusting some of the mobs, like mini bosses in Ruby Life Pools were particularly heinous and they're adjusting those, they're fixing up some of the boss fights, and it's happening. But it is a little scary to me seeing, one, how much time it took for particularly nasty dungeons like Lower Karazhan to get fixed in Shadowlands Season 4, which we know is not a massive priority for Blizzard, and I understand that. But it took like a month or two before Lower Karazhan was, you know, doable, or didn't seem like it was a massive burden to people to be able to run. Looking at Shadowlands, or even before that in BFA, having months of M+, leading up to the expansions. It is also, again, a bit of a head-scratcher that uh, we had months and months of this content to be able to run. And now they're saying, well, it's only available on the weekends, and we don't want people to get too practiced up on these dungeons uh, too far in advance. When there's just a heap of tuning required. There's, you know, boss fights that are doing doing their usual mechanic, which is hitting everybody for 110% of their life over like six seconds or something along those lines. And you're trying to fight for your own survival and you're saying, well, this can't be accurate whatsoever. So some of those things are deeply concerning. And with just about a month left for Dragonflight and probably like a month and a half or so for actual M plus to drop, I am very, very concerned on this one, but it might just, I guess, be something that they completely pivot, spend all their active time correcting and adjusting and fixing up the dungeons, and it, by some miracle it happens. But I would say this is probably the most uh, unpolished M+, that we're about to have going into Dragonflight Season 1. Unless, like I said, they come in clutch, and I'm sure they're working crazy overtime to prepare. But I would definitely you know, warn people and also make sure that they're aware that M plus gonna be a lot harder. You can also push to higher keys to be able to gear up more. And again, that's also gonna be quite a challenge to do so. If there's a number of mobs that are very, very overtuned, we're gonna be under geared. We're gonna be learning the dungeons because we're not having as much time spent onto them. And it's going to be quite wild. So prepare yourself for a very challenging Dragonflight season one. When we're talking about questing, end game, you know, the usual, okay, well, I, raids are not out yet, M plus isn't out yet, what do I do for these first two weeks of the expansion? Okay, well, I've done my raids, I've done my M plus, what else do I do with my free time type of deal? Uh, it's actually very interesting, and this could be, you know, a plus for some people, maybe a negative for some others, but Dragonflight is not nearly as, I don't want to say fleshed out, because that's not accurate, it's not nearly as involved in doing lots of of having to do lots and lots of questing, I guess is the best way to be able to put it. When you played in Shadowlands, you had to go through your weekly quest line for your covenant, and this is how you unlock your player power, and find out on the next episode of Revendreth, ah, you know? You had to do it. You had to interact with this mechanic. If you swapped covenants, you had to play the catch up, you had to do the maw, you had to do the zone, you had to do these things that are tied to your power. And I'm a little worried that people are going to get turned off by this going into Dragonflight because it's not necessarily tied to your player power anymore. It's more of professions, which is kind of like bad luck protection almost, or different ways to increase like your item level. But it's not like it's going to be the end of the world if you're like a couple eye levels lower than, you know, your buddy Bob. Like if Bob sucks at DPS, you're going to kick his ass, right? That kind of deal, you know? So the way I think about it is there's quite a bit of 
reputation grind and renown grind for getting your professions up to snuff. And we'll talk more about the professions and how they work in the next chapter here. But overall, you have to kind of get into the middle. You have to get into like honored or like low revered to with uh, your renown to be able to unlock the actual meat and potatoes of those recipes. The exalted, I know they have different ranks, but like the rank 30 to 40 renown, for example, are like your tailoring recipe makes you this awesome dragon plushy toy. It's not like actual things increasing your power. It's just fluff, which I really like. And I think it's awesome. Not a uh, not poo pooing that at all, but it is going to be a little bit different from Shadowlands in that vein because it's not like you're going to have gobs and gobs and gobs of these chapters and quest lines and all these other things that you need to be worrying about. Some of the things that you should be concerned about are some of the materials that you would like to use to be able to craft or pay somebody else to craft uh, high level gear for you. Okay, so let's say you are a heroic into mythic raider and you just don't give a damn about any of the profession stuff you don't want to touch it you don't want to interact with it but you just can't get boots from the raid for whatever reason if you wanted to get somebody else to make those boots for you there's a great system called the work orders that they're just putting out into testing now but you have to provide some of your own materials and those are primal chaos which you get by doing M plus raiding, world quests, uh, general like quest line stuff. You can find them randomly in treasures out in the world. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Not too hard to collect. And the spark, I believe it's called, of ingenuity, right? Which has, I think, some like weekly or bi-weekly quests that you're able to earn this like rare resource. And if you wanted to make these really high quality boots, you're going to need to give one of those to that crafter to be able to make for you. So that way you're going to be able to uh, have this high level BOP item made for you that you can put on into your gear. Those are going to be some of the very important things that you as say like a raider or even like a high end plus player. If you don't want to interact with the professions themselves or if you do, you're still going to need those sparks of ingenuity, which means you need to go out into the world. You need to keep up with those quests and there are also some of these like dragonflight campaign quests which are giving you more renown more reputation gain and i believe some of the quest rewards are also going to offer you sparks of ingenuity on top of that so by doing those extra quests by spending that extra time out in the world it's sort of a voluntary way for you to get those reagents get those items so that you can find another progression path outside of just grinding M plus or grinding raid until your eyeballs fall out, which personally I think is really good. But I think since there hasn't been a lot of coverage about it, people are going to get a bit of like whiplash or shock value out of it once they actually interact with the game. So keep that in mind. Overall, I would say the system is pretty well fleshed out actually. And I think this is what Blizzard was really referencing when they were talking about, hey, we're further along in the dev cycle, is it seems like they put a lot of thought, time, and effort into this sort of end game. And in terms of how they kind of like nudge you or encourage you to do these tasks, rather than saying, well, if you want to get your fade damage reduction conduit before raid starts, you better do the next quest line of the Revendreth campaign before raid, like, ah, uh, you know, and that is, Ugh, that was not a, a fun time for me, let me tell you. But overall, I'm actually kind of a fan of this, even though it seems like I don't know all of the things just yet. There technically is a like semi Torgas mode, but don't let that turn you off just by me saying it. What it really is, is kind of like a area of the open world where you run around and kill elites. And just by killing them, you get reputation. But also by killing them, you get these pseudo sort of like Torgas powers that only last for like five to 10 to 15 minutes or something like that. And by killing more, you can refresh those buffs. So it's kind of an untime gated rep grind where you have to get to, you know, two out of four of the ranks or three out of four, four of the ranks to be able to get some of the professions, to get some of the other like bonus equipment. And then if you go to like the highest rank, that's just all fluff stuff, right? And that one's actually kind of neat because you could just say, all right, I'm ready to like grind it six hours out of this or eight hours out of this and just be done with it in a day. And I believe you could do that. I already got up from like rank one to like rank two and a half or something like that. And it only took a couple hours and I was doing it as a healer. So I'm pretty sure if everything stays in place, you could also bang that out quite easily as well. If you're curious on beta, it's called the Cobalt Assembly. And like I said, it was actually kind of a neat sort of rep grind that 
just kind of obviously killing monsters the entire time and going after just some rares and getting some powers on top of it. And lastly, we're going to probably dedicate an entire video to this, uh, but I did want to talk about professions. So professions, and I'm going to kind of summarize it. And if you guys like a full length video, be sure to let me know in the comments down below. But professions are a massive part of Dragonflight going forward. You are going to have so much interaction when it comes to your professions. And like I said, think about them as like bad luck protection for yourself. Step one, you are going to have these specializations that come out into your crafting. So for me, I got to level 53 of my Dragonflight tailoring, right? And so now I can have my tailoring mastery where I can get more skill points and make a higher quality item, which is to say, if I wanted to make this helm piece, there's multiple ranks that you could see in the middle of your screen for this helm piece. The baseline will be 343, but as my skill increases, this 343 item becomes a 353, which means just by being good at tailoring and just by using the specializations, the baseline item level of something I create is going to just be better. Uh, you're also able to flex into multiple, multiple different specializations. And to summarize this stuff, you're going to have some that say, hey, you're going to be able to collect more a cloth as you're going out into the world. You're going to be able to get more uh, spools of thread by unraveling things. Oh, you're going to be able to make better uh, chrono cloth or better azure cloth, which are gonna be used for uh, PVP, PVE gear and everything in between, right? So this is going to allow you to say, I wanna focus on this type, type of uh, tailoring early on. Eventually you'll be able to fill in everything, but over time it's, you're gonna have to prioritize what's most important to you. The easiest way to think about this is it's probably going to be good to pool up your knowledge until you figure out what it is that you want to work on. Like I mentioned before, let's say you just have terrible luck getting a belt to drop for you. Well, what you're going to be able to do is you're going to specialize in belt making. So you could make yourself, if you're like a heroic or mythic player, you could get a couple different items that could allow you to further upgrade a crafted piece. And so not only could you make a heroic level belt, that piece could also be a mythic level belt, even though you may not have killed a boss that drops a mythic belt yet. Because you're skilled in tailoring, because you have the uh, additional items that you earn from raiding or mythic plus that could further amplify the value of that item. So if I wanted to make a hood, you have these training matrixes, which also come in raid quality as well, that you can get from raiding, you can get from M plus, you can add to that item and say, I want this piece to be mythic quality or be heroic quality or whatever it might be. You can also customize the secondary stats through your specializations. So you can focus in what you want from that piece of gear. And they go across the board with all the profession things. And again, I think this is where they're a lot more prepared and a lot more polished. Although we also have to talk about the final version, which is a wonderful idea, but there's a bit of stress when it comes to how it supposedly works is the crafting orders. Now, when you go to a table, a crafting table for your profession, one of the biggest things that you're going to interact with is going to be whether or not you want to make something for somebody else uh, and do it off the auction house or have somebody make an item for you. So you'll be able to see, ah, Magic Flapper really, really wants this Wilder Cloth bag. And he's not providing any of his own reagents and he's gonna pay me 50 gold to make this item for him. This is just a way that you can request somebody makes the item and you could start the order and then you have 30 minutes to be able to actually craft it. Otherwise, somebody else can take it. So you can create the item and then you can send it to him, hit him with a nice little smiley face and then boom, here you go. You have then created this wonderful, wonderful bag for the guy and made yourself a little bit of gold in the process. This is like brand new onto the beta. Uh, there's still a number of things they got to fix out. I think some of these were giving me crazy ass Lua errors as well. So obviously take it with a grain of salt. But the overall mission and the overall setup is actually really sick. Not only are you able to make stuff for other people, but you can also request other people to be able to make stuff for you. So I wanted, for example, 382, which by the way is like LFR or normal raid quality gear. I have to provide some of those things I told you about before, like 
those sparks of ingenuity. So I need to go out in the world myself and get these items. I need to go out in the world myself and get Primal Chaos from raids, from M+, from world quests, all of these things. I think we had a world quest in The Waking Shores, which drops a couple of them for repelling the Dejaran forces, right? There is that importance that comes with world quests. So if I wanna be able to make this raid quality piece, I can't just have pay some gold and have somebody make a wonderful, heroic, mythic, uh, eye-level piece without giving anything up but gold. There are certain things that you have to provide that are BOP in order to get this BOP item yourself without having to interact with the profession. So you can infuse it with power to increase its item level, you can change its secondary stats, and you can add bonus effects onto it as well, where you're able to say, oh, when you're above 90% health, gain mastery. Or when you heal, you sometimes fire a healing dart to heal more, right? And you find a little extra ways on top of it to be able to increase your eye level, increase the quality of your gear, and put together your best in slot, right? Uh, professions are an immensely, immensely important part of Dragonflight's endgame. And overall, I'm actually pretty excited about it. They even have a feature here where you can kind of see the quality of the commissions, and you can see, hey, what is everybody else charging? I'd like it if they had something that you can also compare the cost of the materials if somebody isn't providing them. There's a couple little things here and there that need to be worked on in terms of the polish. Uh, the UI, even though I was thinking about getting rid of LVUI and just running the basic, I'm still kind of lacking in extra features and it's a little too basic for me, so I think I'll probably stick with LVUI in the meantime. But I do like that there actually is a pretty solid baseline version of the game. And maybe at some point I'll end up changing my mind and just getting sick of LVY, but we'll see. Overall, I'm excited about Dragonflight, and if I was going to say, you know, how I think the expansion is going to be, I think the expansion is looking really fun from how they sort of nudge you and encourage you to do things, or the reason why you need to do things. But I'm very worried about the lack of polish, specifically given to M+, uh, as well as some of the oddities going on with some of the daily systems for getting more of your profession knowledge from ranking it up and making it a little bit less monotonous. It kind of just got the same daily every single day for a week, and I'm not sure if it's because certain other things are bugged or what. Uh, while leveling, it seemed like the process there was good, but you definitely see a bit more in Endgame where there's polish lacking, it's difficult to be able to get you know, the, the drops that you require to complete some of the quests, some of the uh, the dailies themselves are just kind of annoying and more grindy and time-consuming than some of the others. And I'd have to imagine that all the devs and everything are working ridiculous, ridiculous overtime hours to fix up a slew of the bugs that are going on right now with pre-patch, which is honestly also the whole point of the pre-patch is to get all that shit out of the way so that they have more time to work on other things when the X-Pack drops. Let me know what you guys think if you have any other questions when it comes to that sort of readiness going into Dragonflight. I think if we have like a good content schedule getting into like a 10-1 patch pretty de decently quickly and we can hear about the next level of content and their expectations for kind of like growing the profession system and how that's going to kind of change over time, I think that'd be really damn exciting. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I'm hopeful for Dragonflight and I hope you guys are as well. Thank you for watching if you haven't yet be sure to join our discord and our live stream as well we're gonna be slamming a whole bunch of beta m plus this weekend and otherwise that's it for me hope you all enjoyed it and i'll catch y'all next time